Dr. Dario Chavez is a peach research and extension specialist for the state of Georgia. Uh, he is originally from Ecuador and attained his BS in agriculture sciences, agricultural sciences and production in Zamorano, Honduras. He obtained his MS and PhD degrees in horticulture working with blueberries, citrus, peaches and plums at the University of Florida in Gainesville. His main area of interest uh, at UGA is uh, has a peach focus on orchard management, um, works on tree longevity, uh, irrigation uh, practices in peaches, and uh, root interaction with uh, tree health uh, uh, production and plant breeding in genetics. So, Dr. Chavez, when you are ready, the floor is yours. So, good morning, everybody. Um, First, uh, thank uh, Dan uh, for giving me the opportunity to give you this presentation. Um, it is kind of nice to follow uh, Alfredo because uh, some of the points that he pointed out in general, uh, I think so apply also for peach production and, and I think so in general for any type of fruit tree production. Um, one of the things uh, that I, is more important is basically prevention and I think so in any management uh, in this case peach or any fruit tree uh, management uh, from the point of uh, planting to basically establishment and then maintenance is pretty, pretty important for any disease or pest uh, problems. So today I'm going to present uh, what is basically the peach production and in the southeastern US with use of green technologies. First, I want to just give you an overview about peach production. Uh, China is the number one producer in the world, followed by Italy and then United States. Uh, one of the important things about this is that you can imagine how important is peach production in general uh, for uh, United States. Now, when you think about peach production, uh, you actually think about something that is happening throughout the years. Um, normally, you are looking into a reduction of of the thousands of tons uh, being produced, uh, basically there is a decline currently happening. This could be because of um, consumer acceptance to other type of fruits, availability of different type of fruits, and so on. Now, when you think about a varying acreage of peaches in the United States, then the decline is, is a little bit more extreme. You can see this line that basically goes down. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that uh, peach production in the United States overall is going away. Uh, what it means too is that the growers and production in general is becoming more efficient. And being efficient means uh, both in growing the trees and also managing the trees. Uh, yields are increasing and basically making the, the use of land uh, efficient at all. Now in the case of general information about peach, uh, Georgia ranks number third and uh, U.S. peach production, uh, basically California is number one, South Carolina number two, and we follow uh, them. We have about 40,000 uh, tons of peaches in about 10,000 acres, and it's a, a value of $36 million. One uh, other important point is that it ranks 36 across all the Georgia commodities. Now, uh, everybody knows that uh, Georgia is known as the peach state, and Georgia in, in general has had peaches since the 1800s. Um, basically, peach production, commercial production as is known now, started in Georgia, and this is something unique uh, uh, in comparison with any of the states. When we are thinking about peach production in Georgia and the southeastern U.S., we are uh, talking about fresh consumption. Uh, there is still some canning industry here uh, in some different places, but in general, we're just talking about peaches uh, for fresh consumption in, in supermarkets and, and other areas. Uh, now, something that is interesting, uh, uh, like you just uh, we just received a talk about turf grass. Uh, I don't know how many growers of turf grass probably are in Georgia. I imagine that there is a, a lot of them. But normally, if we talk about uh, peach growers, there are about five growers that account about 90% of the Georgia industry. These are basically five families that, that have about 3,000 acres each. 
Now there is a uh, several smaller growers uh, that we are talking about, maybe uh, below 10 acres uh, per grower that is still uh, uh, are trying to grow on and growing peaches here in, in Georgia. But whenever I am trying to to talk with with the industry, pretty much I am actually sitting probably with about 10 to 12 people. Now, uh, if you think about peaches, normally uh, as a as a Georgian or somebody from the southeastern U.S., you will have your preferred variety. Some people like uh, Alberta, some people like uh, Georgia Bell, and other t different types of variety. Well, each one of the growers in Georgia grows approximately 40 to 60 varieties, and the season starts in the middle of May until the end of August. Now. If you think about the state of Georgia, uh, it's important to have an idea where uh, we're talking that the main area of peach production are located. The first, the main area of peach production is located in Taylor and Crawford Peach County. Now we have some production in South Georgia, um, Bruce County, and some production in Meriwether County. Meriwether County, Taylor County, Crawford County, and Peach County grow kind of the same varieties. Remember, uh, if you're talking about different areas of production, they will have different uh, environments, different conditions. One of the main factors uh, to be able to grow a uh, peach variety is basically adaptation. And adaptation normally, the first thing is, is basically think about how much cold you get, okay? You probably saw in the news uh, a lot uh, this year actually about uh, having a warm winter and not having enough uh, cold or chill this year. So when you talk about an area of production, you normally talk about chill hours. And I will explain a little bit about what are chill hours. So for example, in the center here, in Taylor, Crawford, and Peach County, we have an average, a historical average of 800 chill hours. Now when you talk about South Georgia, you have about oh, 300 hours less than that. Now in Griffin, Georgia, where we are located, we have about 1,000 chill hours. It's basically about 200 chill hours different. What it means is basically we ha can have different varieties that are adapted to different locations. So again, this is the first point that I wanted to bring. Selecting the correct variety for your location is basically the first big decision that you are making. Now, let's talk about children requirements. Children requirements can be determined really quick. You can contact your basically your area agent or you can go to the uh, www.weather.uga.edu and basically look at the weather station uh, nearby where you want to grow peaches. Now, there is a, a tool that determines the amount of chill hours for your area. This, uh, this chill hours is as follows. They are the hours between 32 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit or below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Basically, you count the number of hours that you have gotten that, that kind of weather. It will give you a range, and, and the range normally should be for here, for Georgia, from October to February. Basically, it will give you a number in there if, if you click on the station. Now, if you think about uh, middle Georgia, we talk about having a chill requirement of about 840 chill hours in average. What you can grow in that location is basically plus and minus 200 hours in average, meaning that you can have, uh, grow 650 chill hours peaches and also about 900, 950 chill hour peaches. What it means is basically there is always kind of a variation that, that is al allowed to be grown in that location. So this uh, provides you a good idea about what to, to grow in your location. Now, uh, one thing that's important is that I mentioned that Brooks County has some, some peaches as well. Remember, that is in South Georgia. Uh, what, what it means is that you are going to have a lower chill requirement. You have to avoid cultivars. Uh, uh, basically for Brooks County, if you are trying to grow uh, peaches in Brooks County, you go with cultivars that have this kind of uh, naming, Florida, whatever, and Gulf, whatever series. Uh, the idea is that they are low chill varieties. If you grow these varieties in middle Georgia, what will happen is that they will flower extremely early, and in the first freeze they will die. Now, this is how the website looks. For example, I went in the website 
and I put uh, the station at the USDA ARS in Byron, Georgia. Uh, basically, I selected the chill requirement uh, or the chill hours uh, calculation uh, between October 1st, 2016 to February 6th. Normally, you can put February 10 actually here in 2017, and it will give you the, the number of chill hours. Now, remember, you saw in the news a lot that uh, basically pitch production this year uh, it was very, very low. The main reason for this was that we had a extremely warm winter, meaning that we didn't get that many chill hours accumulated this year. What happens is that chill uh, allows plants to go into dormancy and restarts basically the physiological process of the plant, meaning that when a plant has received uh, the, the est estimate chill hours, basically they will just bloom and then uh, break buds and basically grow normally. If you look in 2013 and 2014, we got about 1,000 chill hours. Now in 2016 and 17, we just got 490 chill hours, meaning that we had we had an extremely, extremely low uh, chill accumulation year. This meant that we just had 20% of the full crop for a year of peach trees, or peach uh, production meaning that basically trees didn't bloom or they had a really hard trouble blooming or basically flower buds drop. So it, you probably, if you are a station agent or somebody that work at, uh, uh, basically with growers, you, you probably found that there were a lot of calls of, of peaches don't producing at all. Now, another important thing, and I think so uh, uh, what Alfredo was saying it was very important that integrated pest management, I think so starts from the point that you select something uh, to plant. And basically, first deciding that what varieties you're going to grow. And that's why I talk about chill requirement and chill adaptation. Now, pre-plant considerations are very important because it will set you for failure or success. What I mean by that is that, for example, one of the most important factors is a spring frost, uh, meaning that if you are going to plant in a location, try to select uh, elevated uh, land basically relative to your surrounding. You know that in here in Georgia and southeastern US, we have freezes and late freezes. And, and the advantage of having a cold air drainage, uh, basically cold air will sink and warm air will rise. And if you have the cold air sinking, you want that that cold air escapes from your orchard, basically avoiding any of the damage. Now, where you plant is very important too, because you will want a north facing uh, slope. What I mean by a north facing slope is basically uh, something like this. You will have the sunshine throughout the day, air, the day and basically warm up the trees and it will keep the temperature warmer. The south facing slope basically will get a little bit colder. Now, always important to have a well-drained soil. Uh, this will basically allow you to keep the, the water out of the, of the orchard. And then you want also a soil that is, it has a, a very nice structure that will allow you a rooting depth of 30, 36 inches. Here's what a, a basically a peach it looks like after a freeze. You see that the alveol is there, is dead, basically a darkened part. And this is very heartbroken because when you have a peach this big, it means that probably you lost everything. Now, one important thing when selecting a site is also looking at the vegetation around. Uh, that would tell you a lot about the soil conditions and about drainage. If you see trees that are associated with wet soils, probably you want to avoid that location. Peach trees don't like to have uh, wet roots, uh, meaning that if you have prolonged time of, of wetness in the soil, they, they will actually die. Now, also water availability and access is very important. What I mean by this is that if you are planting peach trees, probably you need to have water available. In Georgia, uh, traditionally, and in South Carolina, uh, peach tree gr uh, growers plant the tree, and they put irrigation about the third year of production. Uh, uh, basically, trees start producing in the third year or four year after planting. Uh, so irrigation is only put in until you have fruit available. Uh, we're doing some research here at University of Georgia uh, looking at the uh, setup of irrigation in the first stage when it's growing. And basically we're finding that uh, having irrigation from year one is very, very uh, good for the tree and also increases production as well. 
if you think about last year, it was a really drought um, relative year, uh, meaning that if you planted a tree in February, uh, you had all year without a any any really major rains events. So basically, the trees just sat down and they didn't grow at all compared with the trees that actually had irrigation. Now. Oak trees, uh, it's funny, uh, when you're looking at the location, oak trees are very important. Why? Because oak trees actually have oak root rot. Now, peach trees, or the roots of peach trees, are very susceptible to oak root rot. And I will talk a little bit about that. Again, this is kind of a preventive measure. You don't want to go in a location that actually had oak trees before. And another one is basically, if you have peach trees in that location, Basically, you more likely will have nematode problems, and probably you will have some problems also with oak root rot. And this is oak root rot. Uh, basically, if you dig around the tree, you will see the mycelia fans actually uh, coming to the trunk. Another thing that is very important is you want to actually plan ahead, meaning that if you are trying to plan next year, you probably want to start talking and evaluating your location about 6 to 12 months ahead. Now, you want to take so, two soil samples, one at 8 inches and one at 16 inches, meaning that you will want to at least profile where the tree is going to be. Very important is to adjust the pH before you even plant. Uh, the idea is to have about a, a pH of 6. Um, that means that if you have a need for, for lime, basically you want to incorporate that in the root zone. Phosphorus is also very important. It needs to be applied potassium as well. Now, nematode samples is something uh, that has to be done the year before because if you have nematodes in there, you will have to decide if you want to fumigate pre-planting or you have to select adequate rootstock systems to be used. And then contour weeds, as always, uh, the idea is that if you have weeds available or present in the location, the trees normally will not grow, in a, and actually there will be a lot of problems as well. Now, this is normally what we receive from the UGA extension lab, uh, basically from the Ag Services lab. Uh, you send a soil sample. In this case, a man uh, sent a sample only for the eight inches, okay? This was a mixed sample. If you talk at your extension area agent, they can help you with the, they had to collect a random samples from an area. The first in important thing that I, I want to do is basically look at pH. In this case, a pH of 6.2 is fine. Now, you like to look at the different uh, nutrients in this case. For example, phosphorus probably you will want to add uh, before even you plant, uh, incorporated potassium as well. Now, lime, it will be something that is important too, but if you can see that here, uh, the recommendations really doesn't give any recommendations due to the nice pH. Now, if you look at the 8 and 16 inch sample, you can see that the pH is a little bit higher, but it's still okay, and it recommends the phosphorus and potassium uh, uh, to be uh, put in, in the ground. Again, this has to be done prior planting. You want to work in the soil before even planting because this will give you a good start. Now, uh, when you think about a peach tree, uh, some people uh, don't realize, but a peach tree is formed by two actually different uh, parts. You have a scion that is actually grafted in a rootstock. Okay? Uh, why is this system available? Is if you look at a bigger tree or a tree in the field, it, this rootstock system or rootstock is different than the scion variety. Basically, it's because the rootstock is actually has certain characteristics and certain unique features that will allow to grow peaches in the southeastern U.S. all with different conditions. This rootstock system can be resistant to different diseases. Uh, this rootstock system can be uh, unique and uh, adequate to be grown in the soil conditions that you want. So I will talk a little bit more about that. Now. In the case of the scion, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of different scion varieties. Uh, we have, like I mentioned before, 40 to 60 different varieties uh, throughout the season. Now, Chilean requirement is the number one consideration. Again, uh, hours between 32 and 45, you can go to the weather.uga.edu uh, and determine the chill require uh, average accumulation for your location. Now, the second 
most important when you're selecting varieties is probably bacterial spot resistance. What I mean by this is that a lot of the varieties that are currently grown in Georgia are bought from Georgia or produced or bred in the southeastern U.S. or bred in California. What happens is that California varieties normally are highly susceptible to bacterial spot. Uh, meaning that you will have to spray it more uh, just to be able to, to have a fruit that doesn't have blemishes or the leaves actually don't have damage. Other consideration in peaches are you want a melting or non-melting variety. Melting being the peaches that when they are mature and you bite on it, you will get all that, all that juice basically coming in your cheeks. Non-melting varieties are what you think about a pear, a pear or an apple, uh, basically crunchy. Now, flesh colors, you can have yellow, uh, basically white, and other things. Freestone versus cleanstone. Freestones are basically the ones that you can grab the pit out of the flesh, and those are really easy to eat. A lot of people love it. Cleanstones are the ones that the pit actually sticks to the flesh. It's difficult to grow, to, to eat. And ripening dates. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Georgia uh, season goes from the middle of May to the end of August, meaning that if you want a uh, ripening then that you like, basically you will have to select something about that. Now, ripening days, as I mentioned before, it means that you can choose different varieties. Now, each variety to spread out harvest, normally it ripens between one or two weeks of harvest, meaning that a peach grower in Georgia to be able to have peaches every week of the year they have to be basically growing about 40 to 60 different varieties. Now, this is a, a circular, a UGA extension circular, 1063, that has a description of the different harvest period, the chill accumulation or requirement, the variety name, and the characteristics that, that those varieties have. For example, flesh color, flesh texture, pit attachment, and bacteria spot meaning that those probably are the most important, more likely more important uh, characteristics if you want to look and grow a peach tree, in, in this case, uh, probably in a home garden setting. Now, let's talk about rootstock selection. Again, I talk about uh, basically a preventing measure. Rootstock probably is the most important decision that you can make after actually chill requirement determination. Now, Rootstocks, uh, basically, by their own, are varieties. We have about seven different rootstocks available for the southeastern U.S., and those are rootstocks that basically are available and can grow in the region. We have Lovell, Hafford, Nemagar, Guardian, MP29, Sharp, and Florida Guard. Guardian is the standard rootstock uh, used in cultivation of peach here in southeastern U.S. Now, these are the characteristics that basically are the most important when selecting a uh, rootstock. Remember that I mentioned that you have to do soil samples to test for nematodes. Well, if you test for nematodes, normally you will say, well, you have ring nematode or root node nematode. That will allow you to select the proper rootstock that you want. For example, Guardian is fairly good for ring nematode, resistant for root node nematode, and now this is another disease, peach tree short life. Peach tree short life is one of the most devastating diseases in peach tree production. It probably was one of the most important and very, very problematic until Guardian appeared. Guardian basically is very good, uh, it's very resistant for this disease. So that's why Guardian is being used as the standard rootstock. Now, now in, in this currently, uh, basically growers are having a bigger problem, is oak root rot or malaria. This fungi is present on the soil. Once you have it in the soil or a tree dies of it, it starts spreading in the area. Normally you will see, if you look at an orchard, there will be a kind of an area that will start growing and growing with the years. Now if you see the characteristics of all the, all the rootstocks available, all of them are almost susceptible. The only ones that are resistant are MP29 and Sharp. Now, MP29 was a recent release by the USDA. You can see that it has very good characteristics for all the diseases and main diseases. But the still Guardian is the more likely uh, use right now at this point. Now, when you're considering southern growers, we will always have nematode 
problems. So you will have to consider Nemagard or Guardian as, a, as the standard. Now, when you have uproot rot and the growers will know it, you have to recommend probably MP29. You can see that Sharp, it really, we don't know about green nematode. In addition, Sharp really doesn't produce a good yield in general. Now, when you're looking for these rootstocks, you want to actually look for nurseries that can sell them. Well, what I mean by this is that if you are going to plant next year, let's say uh, February 2018, I had to put an order in a nursery in June or May of this year, meaning that if you want a rootstock sign combination, you have to make sure to contact the nursery beforehand. Now, what happens when you have incorrect selection of rootstocks? You have nematode problems, the trees will die. Um, you can see here is a rootstock block that has actually uh, resistant rootstock, and here is a rootstock block that has susceptible rootstocks for nematode. The, normally, the trees would look stunted, and it will be a problem for them. Now, let's let's move on in what is management. When we talk about management, we have different parts. We have orchard design, the tree planting and training, fruit thinning, tree training, and nutrition. I'm just going to go briefly in each one of them, and basically at the end I'm going to spend some time in certain specific diseases as well and pests. What I want to do is, is kind of talk about specific diseases and pests and some of the green technologies or new uh, management strategies that we are seeing in the southeastern U.S. So first, orchard sign. When we talk about an orchard, uh, the most common spacing for an orchard is 18 by 20 feet. Normally, we will get about 121 trees per acre. Uh, orchard design is important because you can actually dis decide to re reduce the amount of trees that, or increase the amount of trees that you have per acre. It will also uh, mean that you will have to accommodate your equipment and management as well. You want to plant across the slope, uh, basically uh, follow the counter of the slope and avoid erosion. Uh, again, I suggested probably having an irrigation as you plant, microjet of drip irrigation. In this case, we have a, a, a actually our irrigation and fertilization experiment here at Griffin Station. The trees that you see here were planted in 2015. Now we had actually our second year uh, this year, and we already have fruit. Normally, peach production and um, peach produces in year three, so that was very uh, nice to see that uh, true or management actually was able to to keep going pretty good. Now. Training is very important. Why? Because it will establish how healthy or how well managed a tree is. What I mean by this is that you want to train a tree in such a way that you can have correct management either by spraying, uh, reach a, a, a good amount of the of the chemical, what you are spraying in the tree. Uh, now, when you're thinking about the trees that you are going to plant, normally the trees come in bare root. Uh, basically, it will be a tree that has just bare roots. And they normally have to be planted at the same depth as the nursery. Why? Because if not, they will have uh, water logging uh, or some um, problems uh, when you plant them. And normally fungi will start growing in the tree and will kill them. You will want to remove the top of the third of this plant and make sure to leave some buds actually in the plant because that will be important above the grab union to make sure that you have the variety that you want. In the case of the tree training year two, uh, you have to start to develop three to four main scaffolds. Uh, this is in the case of the tree training technique called open base. Uh, normally, the scaffolds will be at 18 to 24 inches above the ground, and you will want limbs that actually have a good uh, angle, uh, meaning that they will be able to support a lot of weight. Now. Limbs have to be arranged around the trunk. What I mean is that if you have a circular motion, you will want basically that the limbs are dispersed around in a 360 degree. And now you will want to remove any water sprouts. Water sprouts basically are just taking energy and they will create shade in the center of the tree. And I will show you what I'm talking. Now, normally in a younger tree, you have different types of pruning. Uh, for example, this is a heading pruning. If you prune the tips of the limbs, you will induce pot breaking and branch breaking here in these sections. 
Now, if you want a thinning cut, basically what will happen is that you will induce pot break in the limbs that are still there and you don't will not have anything like that. Here we're talking about a bench cut. Bench cut basically will cut portions of the plant and produce a bud break in the different buds around the, that limb. And then you have also bench cuts here that will establish uh, uh, the different scaffolds. When you're thinking about uh, peach tree in the first year, normally you will can do thinning cuts like this and leave the scaffolds that you like and this will produce some shade for the center or basically do a bench cut or heading that will basically produce your scaffolds. In this case, you have five scaffolds. And again, these scaffolds will be uh, distributed around the tree. So one year old tree uh, before pruning will look like this. You have your main scaffolds here and you can see how it basically will be left after pruning. You can see that the number of limbs is minimal and the scaffolds are located here. The same tree in year two, you can see that scaffolds are maintained and now you have more limbs in there. When you do year three, basically you will keep the scaffolds in there. You will remove any water sprouts and suckers in the season and basically the idea is that pruning will allow you to manage what is the fruiting wood. It will, it will actually determine the fruiting wood that will be uh, fruiting for the next year. And also, it will allow you to keep a health of the tree, meaning that if you keep too many limbs, uh, you will have uh, poor control, for example, in scale uh, for the tree. And also, uh, crop management. Uh, some of the branches could break. Uh, you can have uh, limb fungi growing in the tree, and etc. More important is the fruiting wood uh, for fruit size and light penetration. So if you see a 40-year-old tree, you have the scaffolds that were maintained from year one, and you can see how the tree canopy and open base is basically formed. Now, the next step is fruit thinning. Now, fruit thinning, uh, you have already a set of fruiting wood. Uh, they will flower, bloom, and basically you will have uh, your, your fruit in there. Now, the idea of fruit thinning is because each one of those fruit are actually um, taking some energy from the tree. If you think about all the blooms in a peach tree, you have hundreds and hundreds of, of blooms in there. If you leave all of them, basically the tree will kind of run out of energy. So fruit thinning, what it does is basically increases yield per tree and fruit size. It helps the return bloom and bud set for next year and also improves tree health because you don't want overcrop trees. Now, the, the time for fruit thinning is about uh, before 40 days after bloom. Now, when you see bloom thin, uh, fruit thinning, normally you will see tons and hundreds and even thousands of fruitlets down in the tree. If you look at the fruit spacing, normally it's about six to eight inches of a spacing between them. And what happens is that you leave fruit uh, a position in the different limbs. Normally you want about 200, uh, 300 maybe tree, uh, fruit in a, in a large tree. And that will allow that the fruit will be large actually. Nutrition. Nutrition is very important. You collect leaf samples uh, for foliar analysis in July and August. Foliar analysis will give you a, a direct link of how is nutrients being assimilated by the tree. Now, it will be important to have some soil samples as well because it will allow you to know what's going on as well. You want to select the same tree and follow it year after year. It will allow you to determine if you are doing a good management techniques. The fertilization is very standard. In this case, we're doing some studies to try to determine if we can lower the amount of fertilizer. We are actually finding that with a lower amount of fertilizer, we don't have any any symptoms of uh, deficiency. And when we do leaf analysis, also we don't have any problems. So the standard uh, recommendation is three applications. And the application amounts change depending on the year. For example, for the first application, you will go use 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, a pound in the first year, in the second year, two pounds, and then you maintain the third year the same recommendations. Check always the leaf samples to see how they are doing. Now you will have an application in May and July, a pound of calcium nitrate and a pound of calcium nitrate uh, for each, and then you will increase that at 1.25 uh, each year.
and you follow that recommendation throughout the years. Now, let's talk a little bit about insect pests. Now I'm just going to kind of describe and mention really, really briefly the different insect pests that we have in fish production. We have a scale insects, a San Jose scale, white peach scale. Those are big problems in, in peach production. What happens is that they will be found in, in scaffolds and they will kill actually whole scaffolds. We have our entomologist, uh, Brett Blau, that does other research with them. Now we have pores, the bores, uh, we have the peach tree bore and the lesser peach tree bore, and I will be talking a little bit more about those actually. And then we have fruit feeders, prong curculio, steam box, sap beetles, and trips. So let's talk about bores uh, in general. Now let's talk first about the lesser peach tree bore. I will talk about the control, the chemical control, and talk a little bit about green options in here. When we talk about lesser peach tree bore, what happens is that if you look at the peach tree, you will see a lot of gumming and frass. Normally, if you use your knife or something to remove that frass, you will find actually a larvae inside of that. They can attack scaffoldings and, and crotch, and normally they love pruning woods and injury sites. So keeping your tree healthy through nutrition management, basically, and pruning can avoid you a lot of these issues. Um, when lesser peach tree borer is found here, it can actually kill the whole scaffold. Now, normally they will start lay eggs in March to November. Pyrotroids uh, will suppress some of the lesser peach tree borers, but chlorophyrophores in post harvest cover spray is necessary. Uh, normally we use Lorsban after the harvest, and basically that will kill any any uh, presence of the lesser peach tree borer. Now. What you can see with that is a, basically a, a big problem. Now, we have another bore that's the peach tree bore. The difference with the peach tree bore and the lesser peach tree bore is that the peach tree bore attacks what we talk uh, basically uh, in la galleries of the bud of the tree and major roots. Basically, they will just be killing what it connects the trunk with the root system and it will just do galleries in there. You will see the frass and the gumming and it will create a lot of damage. They emerge in mid to late summer and the August and September is the peak. Remember, I talk about uh, the same kind of date and, and post-harvest application of chlorophyrophores for lizard peach tree borer. Now, in the case of the peach tree borer control, we had kind of similar. We will do the course display with a hand phone to the butt of the tree and basically, we'll kind of wet it and make sure that that chemical does in the way. The same kind of compounds, Ryman as well, and they actually provided a good control in some trials done here at UGA. And again, applications made at post-harvest and early September are important. Now, in the bore control, we talk about lesser peach tree bore and peach tree bore. The stressed trees are more susceptible. Again, this is very important. If you don't keep the uh, management of your orchard and there is some stress for other reasons, more likely you will have some damage by boars. The same thing with the scales, actually, and all other insects and diseases as well. Wounds uh, during true pruning and other things are very attractive. And they can actually reduce the, the tree life by uh, greater than two years. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the green technologies being done in UGA. Uh, this is uh, some slides taken by the presentation done by Ted Cottrell, the a scientist from the USDA, and Dan Gordon from University of Georgia. Um, I asked them for permission to use this, and what they are doing is what's is called disruption, uh, made in disruption for bores. Uh, here we have lesser peach tree bore injuries. You can see that the tree, the rootstock is still growing, but all the limbs are dead. Now, peach tree bore attacks next to the crown. Basically, you can see how that can kill a tree easily. Mating disruption, how it works. So you have a female and a male. Basically, uh, the female releases some of pheromones, uh, and the male follows that through and basically goes and mates. Now, the disruption works in the following way. We have a twisty type with pheromones. Uh, we put them in the tree. And you have the wind. And these are located in different areas of the orchard. So what happens is that the pheromones will be released everywhere, and basically the male will not know where is the female, okay? 
So this is how it works pretty much. Now, the advantage is that it, Terrace was released, uh, our company actually produced a season loan dispenser for the Southeast. Um, Dan and Ted did an, a great research. What they decided to do is basically grow, grab one of the growers. Again, remember, we have five families that have about 90% of the of their peach production in the state, and grabbed one of the growers and decided to do all the orchards in that area. If you can see, this is a big area, four by 5.3 miles. And basically, they put um, these dispensers in trees, about 150 uh, dispensers per acre in all the peaches. And basically, the idea is that you want to do an area-wide, uh, basically, mating disruption. So you don't have other orchards that the, the, the mods will escape. So. This is the uh, dispenser. It's called Isomate uh, Lesser Peach Tree Bore Plus. Uh, again, 150 per acre. You have to actually treat all of it. You cannot actually just do a part. You have to do all of it. And the dispensers are normally applied after pruning. And you can understand why, because you don't want to remove the branches that would have the, the, the dispenser. And actually affects peach tree bore and lesser peach tree bore. So what, what the results show is uh, basically they grabbed one of the locations and they were not able to find any lesser peach tree bore wounds and not in the activity of peach tree bore. So basically this was highly successful. What it means is that they remove, um, compared with the application of chlorophyll force that is normally used for both of them, now basically you are facing out that application, that chemical application. You know that the EPA was thinking about removing that and it was kind of refuted, but later, sooner or later, that chemical is going to be removed out of the list of application. But now the growers have an option available. So one of the things is that normally you would put the, the, the band in the tree like that, and you don't want to put two or three more. It really doesn't have the same effect. Again, 150 dispensers per acre is pretty good. Now I'm going to talk about another green technology, and is the use of beneficial nematodes for the control of peach tree bores. Uh, this is a research that was part of uh, the scientists uh, leading this is Dr. David Shapiro at the USDA, uh, with collaboration of Ted and Dan Horton and Jeff Cook, that is the peach area agent for uh, the Georgia. What it works is basically there are two genera, Sternanema and Terohabditis. Um, the nice thing is that there are side bioinsecticides, uh, basically exempt for EPU registration. They can be applied in any of the agricultural equipments. And what is cool about these guys is that actually they can, um, they can basically are first commercially available and they can attack other different types of, of, of pests. Okay. Now. It really, what, what it kills is actually the, the, the symbi symbiotic partner or the bacteria. Basically, what happens is that you have the infected juveniles or nematodes. They affect the larvae or poopy, and basically, they will go inside of the insect. The bacteria is released. The insect dies. The, the, all the nematodes basically will reproduce, and then they will leave and infect again. So it's a kind of a nice cycle. What, what we did, uh, and in this case, actually, David did for lesser peach tree bore, he actually decided to test applications to the trunks and with a handgun and using something that's called barricade as the commercial product, and it's a fire gel. The idea was that using this fire gel, it will keep the nematodes alive and they will not desiccate. What he did is basically tested nematodes for barricade with different concentrations nematodes without barricade, and the standard com a commercial, a basically, a control, and it shows a water control. A, if you look at this uh, graph really quick, you can see that the control, uh, basically, um, and, the, and the nematodes only, basically had uh, the highest rate of, of, of a life, and the controlling here is just water only. Now, when you look at the chemical uh, and the nematodes plus barricade, they have similar effects. Now, when you see a percentage control, you can see that the nematodes plus barricade had a really nice control comparable to the chemical control. 
basically telling you that this is actually something that also can be used as, as a green technology. Now we did this also in organic production. We thought, well, let's try it. Uh, you know, organic production is so difficult because sometimes you don't have the techniques. So what we're trying to do is now uh, use the nematodes with pine mulch, nematodes only, the very vachana, and the untreated control. In the first year of data, we have low infestation with peach tree borer. But in the second year, we actually got some uh, nice results. So what we normally would do in the organic producer, we will have mulch. First, we will inoculate the nematodes in the trunk base, and then we'll put mulch and irrigate. And there is other control that basically didn't have the mulch. So what we saw is that if you look at the non-treated control, uh, the percentage of infested was 50% of trees were infested compared to the berry versiana and the different uh, nematodes without and with mulch that basically have a comparable of just 10%, meaning that it had a nice control even in organic production. Now, the application of the entomopathogenic nematodes normally happens, you put about 1.5 million of nematodes per tree, and you will normally do it in 100 milliliters, and then you water it with about a gallon of water. You want to uh, irrigate that plant or to avoid desiccation of the nematodes every three to four days for the first two weeks. Now, the nice thing, again, there are commercial products available, and then you can do also injection or irrigation of these nematodes within the system if you have an injector. This is a, a being tested right now. Now, in the case of diseases of peach, I'm going to just mention it really quick. We have uh, basically flossum blight and brown rot create uh, caused by monolinea fructicola. I will talk a little bit about some green technologies just barely briefly. Then you have fruit uh, diseases, scab and trypnox. Bacteria spot for leaves and fruit, I mentioned before, selection of the scion is very important for this. And then trunk diseases, bacterial canker, armillary root rot, again, root selection, root dot selection, factor to run fungal gomosis. So let's start about brown rot. Brown rot basically is everywhere. Monolinia is everywhere. If you don't treat for brown rot, basically you will have issues. Normally we're spraying every other week uh, from brown rot when you have a fruit present. And this is normally uh, appears in the, uh, as blossom blight as a first appearance. And then you can create problems with the stems. Then the uh, blooms uh, will be infected, the stems will be infected, and then fruit will be infected, and finally the mature fruit. Uh, inoculum is always present. This is a, a slide that I that basically took from uh, Dr. Phil Brannan, our pathologist. Here is actually the spraying uh, schedule for uh, just blossom blight and brown growth. If you can hear, here we have the stages of the plant, bloom, petal fall, then we have cover sprays when we have the fruit present, pre-harvest and post-harvest. We're actually spraying almost every 10 to 14 days and almost basically always spraying. This is actually a, a disease that has a lot, a lot of problems uh, in peach production. Now, what people are trying to do, Clemson University is basically testing what is called paper bags and actually covering fruits uh, with paper bags, you can see how the paper bags are actually located in the trees. Now, one important thing about this is that uh, you can see that when you think about commercially uh, applicable, it's a little bit difficult to do. Uh, this could be an option for organic producers and uh, basically high specialty markets. Uh, we are part of an OEI grant uh, with Clemson University and we're studying the impact of this to reduce some of the, of the of the applications that we do and also disease pressure. Our malaria root rot, we have off root rot. Again, I already described that the rootstocks have different characteristics for this. Now, I want to just talk about different planting methods. This is called a walking tree, that is a walking, walking tree technique, sorry. So what it does is basically you plant this tree in a bed. So imagine that there was a bed here. You let it grow for two years, and then you came with an air spade and remove all the soil from around it. What happens is that oak root is a fungi. The fungi will grow from the root, 
and then it will stop here because uh, basically the fungi doesn't like to grow actually in where the sunlight is hitting. What it happens is basically will kill this root, but it will not reach the crown and kill the tree in general. So it's kind of a management technique. Now, we talk about rootstocks. MP29 is a resistant uh, rootstock for uh, armillaria. This is a study that was done in a high hot spot armillaria planting. You have sharp that is another resistant rootstock and guardian that is a highly susceptible rootstock. If you see in the first five years, guardian already have 50% of mortality in, an, in whatever plot was this, meaning that if you have 100 trees in a location, basically 50 of them were dead. You can see that MP29 and Sharp, they are still giving you some options. Basically, it will give you an option to still have trees. Normally, peach growers, once they have off-root rot in a location, they never go back there. So MP29 is giving them the option to do that. Nematodes, again, we have reed, lesion, and root node nematodes. You want to sample uh, soils in February and September. February and April is for green, and September and October for root run and root lesion. It's important because you have to fumigate as needed, like as I mentioned. But again, a green technology, or like I talked before, pest management technique, um, something proactive, is using a rootstock that's actually resistant. So all uh, the other information about the other different uh, diseases and the chemical controls and pest management culture guide is located in Southeastern Peach Nectar and Plum Pest Management Culture Guide. It, it actually gives you pest recommendations by grow the stage. It's very easy to understand and it actually gives you threshold levels and spray directions. And it gives you the pesticide rating including. This is actually updated every year and it's available a website online and you can find it here. So if you click there, you can actually pull it and download. Uh, it's very, very easy to follow and it's very useful. Uh, there is some contact information for different scientists that you can ask questions to. And finally, reaching the end, I want to acknowledge all uh, my Peach Lab members, uh, my technicians, Magosha and Will, uh, and a former technician, Liam Paul, and UGA collaborators uh, and USDA collaborators. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Another right. link, sorry, another links that I have is the blog extension uh, for the Peach team. Here we normally uh, publish uh, information. Uh, if we see something in the field, uh, we should basically publish something really quick. And there is also the Georgia Peach Commodity site. Uh, thank you. Very good, Dario. Uh, we don't get enough on peaches. As uh, uh, you gave a lot of information there in, in your uh, in your presentation. We did have a few questions come in. Uh, being an entomologist, I, I uh, this one came to my mind. Are you talked pretty good about uh, borers? But can you comment? Are there are there peach growers on the lookout for any inv any invasive insects or diseases that maybe haven't shown up yet, but maybe have the potential to be pests in Georgia peaches? Yeah, so so actually it's kind of interesting that question because uh, as you mentioned before, I came from Florida um, grad school. Normally, all the all the the pests, insect pests, and uh, that are coming from somewhere else first start in Florida and they come up, and and if they are able to overwinter, then they can become a pest. So I I have been part of a, a grant looking at weevils. There are some weevils that actually are coming from different places that love peaches. Uh, so they are already located in Florida. Thanks God we haven't seen them uh, here in middle Georgia. They already have been spotted in, in south Georgia. So yeah, we're, we're looking into doing some research. Uh, uh, preliminary research has shown that they, there is actually a feeding preference for different varieties, so which is kind of unique. Uh, but then uh, treatment and chemical treatment and all that information is pretty much done in Florida right now. Uh, it, so it's somewhat an advantage that it's happening first in Florida, um, but at the same time, we're, we're collaborating with them to, to find out uh, how it can affect our, our region as well. And they're invasive? Are they invasive in Florida, yeah. Dario, I guess? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. 
So there is, uh, for example, the, the one that comes to my mind is uh, one weevil from Sri Lanka. It's called the Sri Lanka weevil. Oh, and yeah. if it, if it's actually in leaves, and if you put peaches and any other fruit tree around, it will go to peaches. <laughs> is that so, the white? That white? Is it white? I, the white yes, weevil? it is. It is. Yeah. They'll eat everything. So, Those things it, eat everything. Yeah. So so that's one that we have been trying to get funding from this year. I to to do some research, but uh, we haven't been lucky uh, yet. But probably we'll start doing some research just for feeding preference, I guess, with mm -hmm. the different varieties. We have a, a block of different varieties here in Griffin, so that can be an advantage just for screening those kind of things. So next question here, Dario. Being an, I'm an, you know, as as an urban entomologist, we we see subterranean termites eating lots of weird things from time to time. Do you do you ever run into subterranean termite issues in in peach uh, root? And, you know, during especially during periods of drought. You know, I have seen uh, termites once the tree is, is actually going down. It's kind of like when the tree is not not looking pretty good, you you will see them there. Um, what I, what I have noticed is that normally, it, it, it as a grower, what you do is basically you you cut the trunk. You will not really remove the trees if you have still an orchard or trees present in there. Uh, so uh, the termites uh, stay there actually until you basically are removing the whole orchard. Then you will get rid of any roots, root system. Um, it is actually something interesting too. For example, uh, I'm not talking about termites, but weevils. Um, in Florida, again, one thing that I saw is that um, you know that citrus is a big problem in there. Uh, they are having a lot of issues with uh, greening. So they are looking for alternatives. So a lot of citrus growers, what they have done is they they actually remove all the citrus orchards and they planted trees in there. Well, a lot of these root uh, feeding insects that were actually in citrus, either termites or weevils or whatever, stay there and actually are attacking peaches. Normally we don't see them in peaches, but they are starting to attack. I guess if we start a using some different land or some different places, probably we'll see them more mm. here in Georgia. But mm. normally the areas that we have, they have been in peach production for years. Uh, so uh, normally when you plant a new orchard and you find a virgin soil for peaches, the trees are just wonderful. Mm. <clears throat> Getting back to your, uh, you opened up, Dario, talking about chill hours, the importance of chill hours for yeah. peaches. Has it looked like you you had basically half the chill hours last year than you did four years prior? Yeah, we Are, did. Is that is that prompting some of the growers to think about planting new strains of peaches in their orchard? Yeah, so so that's one 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 question that actually I have been thinking about um, a lot actually. Um, you know, peach growers normally, uh, if you think about it, if there is a lot of modeling trying to look into the amount of chill hours that we will receive in, in further years. I, I guess it's difficult to tell if this would be just a kind of a fluke, just one year, or it's going to become the norm. Uh, yes, normally, peach, uh, if you look at uh, records, uh, peach growers in the 50s probably were able to grow 950 to 1,000 chill hour trees. Currently, they just go up to 850 chill hour trees in middle Georgia, okay, meaning that uh, they don't, they they are not able to produce anything about that uh, because just there are some years that they will make it and some years that will not make it, and basically economically speaking is bad. Now the other extreme, going to a really low low chill, is an issue too because we have freezes in here. So there is there is some research that I'm trying to do, looking into different. Uh, aspects of, of basically uh, chill and seeing if we can do something about it. Yeah, those are important questions, aren't they? Yeah, they are. All right, do we have any more questions, folks? Dario, that was really good. I, I uh, These will be recorded, by the way, and for the county agents at some point in the in the future, they'll be able to use these for uh, uh, for credit. So uh, we'll have we'll have Department of Ag uh, numbers on all of these. Uh, Archives, both archives from this morning, and people will be able to log on. The county agents will be able to log on and show these. So, thanks a lot, Dario. 
And Alfredo, if you're still there, thank you very much. Uh,